let's move on to fat. And, you know, fat gets a lot of positive and negative press. And just like carbohydrate, there's a whole slew of misinformation out there. So first of all, you know, it's interesting. In the early 90s, dietary fat received the same bad rap that carbohydrates um, received about 10 or so years later. And it was thought the fat would be detrimental to performance and health and cause weight gain when eaten in excess. And actually, contrary to the popular, that popular belief, scientists are now realizing more and more that fats play an absolutely crucial role in the body for performance and health. Just like the other nutrients, though, we're not just talking about quantity. We want to focus on the quality of fat. And really, maybe even more so than the quantity, let's look at the details. You know, first, we always have to go back to the science. And without getting too technical, um, let's look at the three different primary types of fat. Saturated fat, monounsaturated fat, and polyunsaturated fat. So all fatty acids have the same basic structure. They're really a chain of carbon atoms with varying amounts of hydrogen atoms attached to each carbon. And now, you know, one simple way of describing the various types of fat is to think of the structure of fats as a school bus. The bus itself being the carbon atom chain, and then all the seats are the hydrogen atoms. A saturated fat would be if there is no room on that bus for any more kids. The bus is 100% full. That's saturated. Monounsaturated, mono meaning one, would mean there's one empty seat on that bus. Finally, polyunsaturated would mean more than one empty seat. And you can see the structure on the screen of what each of those looks like. Now let's make it, you know, let's give the take home points for consumers. Very easy to think of these. Saturated fats, as a general rule of thumb, are solid at room temperature. Think of foods like butter. Um, animal fats, shortening, which is both saturated and trans fat, which we'll talk about. Vegetable, excuse me, monounsaturated fats and polyunsaturated fats are liquid at room temperature. So think about the vegetable oils, olive oil, canola oil, flax oil, fish oil. Those are all liquid at room temperature. That's easy for a client to think about. And finally, this is not one of the primary types of fats, but we have trans fats. And trans fats are, you know, they've been in the literature a lot lately and they will continue to be. Trans fats are basically vegetable fats that have been changed chemically by a process known as hydrogenation. And basically what happens is, if you remember that, think about that school bus example, the unsaturated fats, both mono and poly, had empty seats on the, on the bus that I described earlier. Well, trans fats are like artificially filling up those seats. And the benefit to the food company, and again, this isn't the benefit to humans, but the benefit to the food company is that by doing this, by adding hydrogen, it makes the fat essentially solid at room temperature, and therefore, think back to what I said, more like a saturated fat. The benefit then becomes is that increases the shelf life, it decreases the cost for the food company because it's, it's more cost effective, and at the same time, it also gives that same kind of mouthfeel or consistency as a saturated fat would. So in baked goods, pastries, f we know what those taste like and we're used to that same consistency and mouthfeel. Trans fats have that effect. Now, because of the known detriment to our health, starting in 2006, all food companies it was made mandatory that all food companies had to include trans fats on the food labels. That is very important, and it's a great take-home point when you're talking to consumers, teaching them how to read food labels and keying in on things like trans fats. Now, what's important is looking not only at the, at the food label itself, but also the ingredient list. And anytime you see the words hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated on the ingredient list, that means the food does contain some trans fat, if it says zero, but it still has those words on it, the hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated, that means there is a low amount, less than 0.5 grams per serving of food. But remember that a lot of those foods, people don't just eat one serving, chips, um, cookies, things along those lines. So ideally, you want to avoid foods um, that have trans fat or any foods that list the hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated oils. With protein, we talked about something called essential amino acids. 
Now, with fats, there are also something called essential fatty acids. And the essential fatty acids, just like with amino acids, that means that the body cannot make them in and of itself. It needs to consume them through the diet. Now, we have the um, different types of essential fatty acids. And again, I'm not going to delve into advanced biochemistry, but looking at the, the different lengths of the carbon chain, we showed you those structures earlier, that really makes the specific types of fat. Now, the omega-3 fats are a family of what's known as essential unsaturated fats, essential fatty acids, and they've really received a tremendous amount of press lately. They're touted for their heart health properties, their potential aid in recovery, reducing the risk of several other diseases as well. Omega-6 fats are also essential, so again, we do need to consume them through the diet, but when you look at the literature, we don't have any concern about consuming them. We're consuming, unfortunately, way too much. So we need to look at the omega-3 fats, and this is, again, great take-home point for your clients, is here's a handout. Where do you get those omega-3 fats? Well, fish, number one, is a great, great source, um, but maybe your clients are vegetarians or don't eat fish. Um, flaxseed or flax oil. Um, nuts, almonds, and walnuts in particular, even some vegetables give very low doses um, of, of omega-3 fats. And also algae is another source of omega-3 fats. Probably not the most commonly consumed food in the diet, but fish is one of the best sources. And just to make it really easy for you, again, I want to give you the, the points that you need to talk to your clients. Again, you're probably not talking to your clients about the structure and carbon chain length and hydroxy groups and things like that. What you are going to talk to them about is here are how to choose your fats wisely. Well within your scope of practice to give them a handout about smart nutrition intake along these lines. So we have different categories, just like I had set up for carbohydrates and protein, um, with the, the select most often, moderately, and least often. So having your clients think about those is going to be the best, um, most easiest, most simple way to educate them. You know, I mentioned in the very, very beginning of this lecture about different foods and the different nutrients they provide. And again, I, I mentioned that people don't eat to eat nutrients. They eat for to eat food. Well, looking at the different macronutrients and the foods we eat, um, there's also something that's important, you know, getting away from the specific the nutrients that do make up the foods, how these foods are broken down in the system and how these foods actually um, affect our digestion and our, and our performance ultimately because that's what we're talking about. You're working with clients, um, physical performance, but then also mental performance as well. And one thing we, we do need to talk a little bit about is how the macronutrients are, um, you know, after they're broken down in the body, how long, how does that affect um, what's known as the gastric emptying time? Because I think we do talk about you know, why it's important to have your clients or to recommend that they may eat every, every few hours. Well, you know, why, why that recommendation? What does that do for us? Well, we look at what's called gastric emptying time, and that's really the time it takes for the stomach to empty. It's normally about eh, one to four hours, depending on the food consumed and you know, what was eaten together. So something like carbohydrates, um, again, depending on the type, it's going to be broken down uh, more, more quickly than protein or than fat. So again, big difference in the quality. So eating sugar is going to be, is going to break down more quickly than sitting down to a bowl of whole grain oats topped with fruit. Um, so that's why we recommend eating a mixed diet of all different types of foods. And that will help um, keep the food in the stomach longer. And the benefit to that is that you are more satiated, your clients are more full, and therefore ultimately are, are less likely to overeat calories. Now, it's important to consider, again, with workout times and things about recommending simple um, food suggestions before physical activity. Um, but again, very important to make sure you're within your scope of practice when doing so and you know, have the work with the client and ideally a, you know, a dietitian in the case of a physical, physically active individual, a sports dietitian to really make the best, uh, best decisions and recommendations without crossing that line.